Man, I am like, you know, after being in the Word now for about, I guess, you know, maybe 15 years, besides being, you know, in church my whole life, I really didn't, my life didn't really change till about 15 years ago when I started studying, you know, from a Jewish perspective, meaning just learning the customs and, and all this kind of stuff is where the Lord really just flipped the lights on for me and just begin to show just some amazing things in his word. But I really started, you know, in doing so, I really started picking up on a lot of, uh, you know, little hints that God gives us in his word through just reading the gospels and, and the letters from Paul and stuff like that and making some connections that you guys already know. I've said a thousand times that, you know, Jesus said, that in John chapter 5 that you search the scriptures and in them you think you have life but that they would speak of me Amen. so and he said you know if you would have believed Moses you would have believed me for he wrote of me the whole word of God though, is is all about Christ you know it's all about him it's all concealed and it's really amazing when you can go in and begin to dig in God's Word and he just begins to show you things but not only that when we read in the Bible and we find like when uh, Jesus is talking about the new birth in John chapter 3 or whether Paul's talking about it in 1st Corinthians 15 or 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 or 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 or in Romans chapter 5 with the new birth and and he starts making these connections you know and you'll find out that he always in the context of what's being said, it always brings us back to the beginning, you know, which is absolutely amazing. So that, you know, if you don't understand, you know, the beginning, you'll never grab a really good concept of what Jesus is talking about. Like in John chapter 3, for instance, you know, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says, you know, must a, old, a, a man enter back into his mother's womb? So this connection between the mother's womb and the new birth, you know, being born again, he's making a connection here, right? But then he gives some more insight, you know, and then he says, uh, unless a man is born of spirit and of water. So now we got water thrown into the mix, okay? And then he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then he says something else that adds on to this. He says, the wind blows where it wants. But you can't see it, you know, and you don't know where it's come from or where it's going. Now he's making a direct connection to the wind, you know, and so is the one that's, that's born again. So these little bitty things that we read over, you know, you know, we really don't make a really good connection other than what we're kind of taught and believe just from where we at, you know. But the word wind is the word ruach hakadesh, the breath or the spirit of God. So the spirit of God is part of this new birth process and and everything that's going on. So the wind or the spirit of God plays an active role in the birth of or the new birth of a believer, just like the wind played an active role in the birth of creation. Wow, it hovered, right? Just like we see this, the wind in the upper room, and they came the sound of a Russian mighty wind, right? So you get this, here we back in the, you know, seeing this wind picture again, and you're gonna find out that they're always in the context, if you pay close attention, it's gonna direct us back to the beginning. No different than the way that John, in John chapter 1, you know, he says, in the beginning was the Word, right? Yeah. Well, that word, word, in the beginning right there, that's the word Genesis. John is saying, he would say when he's ministering, in Genesis was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and tabernacled among us. So, that's a big thing, you know, to those that are over there because when he says in the beginning and our King James version in the beginning you know we just think in in the beginning but John is making a direct connection to Genesis 
as he does in 1 John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. You know, our hands had touched Him you know, and handled Him. So he's saying the Word in the beginning. He's saying, in Genesis, my brethren, this is what happened. You know, God said, let there be light. And in 1 John chapter 1, he's saying, in the beginning, you know, this light was Jesus Christ. So all I'm telling you is to get a really good understanding of what's being said, man, it, it's absolutely amazing when you go back into the scriptures. So, hey Ma, good to see you. So, you know, God has given us, I'm going to be getting into the Exodus, okay? So let's get started. Man, you guys are in for a ride. You in for a ride. So, um, let me, uh, we're going to be talking about the exodus that was, the exodus that is, and the exodus that is to come. Exodus revealed. Now, just so you know, I stopped at giving an account biblically. I wrote down um, about 22 exodus accounts in the Bible. Okay? 22. And there's, there's probably a hundred or more. All right, I just stopped at 22. But when I say Exodus to you, you know, the first thing you think about is Moses leaving Egypt. That's what you think about. Right? But, you know, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking, uh, talking about before I get into it. Where in the Bible... Would you believe was the first exodus? In the garden. Wow. When Adam was put out of the garden. That was probably the first exodus, huh? That was the second. That's right. Peter's right. Lucifer was exiled out of heaven. Wow. We can even take it a step further. You know, Goliath's name means exile. Exile. Exile, to exit, exodus, mm -hmm. departure, right? Just wow. That's only, and when you start looking at all of these exoduses, man, they're all saying the same thing. So you guys ready? Yeah. Let's get started. You're going to find out what the exodus really means and what it's really all about. So let's get started. Thank you, Lord. Man, I was wanting to do this last week, but you definitely, Lord, just have your perfect timing. The Exodus is the record of Israel's birth as a nation. Within the protective womb of Egypt, listen, the Jewish family of 70 rapidly multiplies from Jacob and his 12 sons. Now I'm going to give you some information here to connect dots for you because here we got Egypt is being called a womb. Literally, from the Bible, right? It's where God, you know, raised the children of Israel, okay? You got the Jewish family of 70 rapidly multiplying from Jacob and his 12 sons. Anybody know any place else in the Bible that talks about 70 and 12? Well, that was 12. There you go. John said 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. Jesus had 12 disciples and 70 other in yeah. Luke chapter 10. Yeah. You see, all of these are going to start making a picture. It says... Check this out now. The exodus that was, the exodus that is, and the exodus that is to come. At the right time, accompanied with severe birth pains, an infant nation numbering between two to three million people is brought into the world where it is divinely protected, fed, and nurtured. Wow. They came out of Egypt by severe birth pains. Wow, does that kind of sound familiar? 
you know, hey guys, good to see you. Does that sound familiar? Wow, doesn't the Lord say something about in the in Matthew chapter 24 about just as a woman is is in travail, we're going to be called up and taken out of here? Amen. Wow, that's you see the connection? Amazing. Amazing stuff. The word exodus means to exit, departure, or going out of. So the children of Israel was nurtured in the womb of Egypt. So Egypt is a womb. That's pretty amazing. Inside the womb, there's darkness. You can't see, right? right. Egypt means black or darkness. Wow. wow. <laughs> well, man, I'm telling you, you for a ride. Also, it can mean death. Exodus can also mean death or be sp also it can mean death as spoken of in Luke chapter 9 and verse 31 where Jesus spoke of his departure from the earth right and also in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 where Peter talked about his departure uh, or his death he knew what death he was going to have to face because the Lord had told him so you know people depart this world and leave it's called the, an exodus right when they die a departure and so it's the same word to die to depart to exit right this embodies the exodus theme of redemption because redemption can only be accomplished by death the only way that you and I can be redeemed is because of what Christ has done right exodus contains messianic prophecies figures and pictures of Christ that's what we're doing, looking for him, right? Let me give you some examples of that. Number one, Moses, in a dozen ways, is a figure of Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, both Moses and Jesus are prophets, priests, and king. Although Moses was never made a king, he functioned as a ruler of Israel. Both were kinsmen's redeemer. Moses redeemed Israel. Jesus redeemed us. Direct connection. Redeemers, bo both the redeemers, they were both endangered at birth, right? In infancy, both rejected wealth and power. Both were deliverers, lawgivers, and mediators. Wow. Moses says, For God shall raise up a prophet liken unto myself. Him shall ye hear. Well, how did Moses... Moses rejected the wealth of Egypt, right? Right. Jesus, you know, you, first thing we think about, well, he left heaven to come down to man, right. right? But he also, there was, he rejected wealth. Remember when he was carried out into the wilderness? Turn the stones into bread, right? Yeah. Deuteronomy 8, he quotes. But then he says, takes him up on Mount Nebo, Mount Height, the height of uh, Mount Nebo. He says, bow down and worship me. Show them all the kingdoms in a moment. Bow down and worship me, and I will give you what has been given unto me. Rejected the wealth. Right. Right. The Passover in John chapter 1, verse 29 and 36. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it is clear that Christ was the slain Lamb of God. Right? We know that. They put the Lamb on a door. I'm connecting you with Moses and Christ, the Exodus, and what Christ done. So I'm giving you the pictures, the prophecies of what was to come and how we can see it and get a better understanding of it. It says, God slayed, check this out. God slayed the first lamb when Adam sinned in the garden on Tishri 10, which was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which was in September, the fall of the year, right? Adam's sin brought death, and this is the reason for our fall season followed by the winter where all the leaves die. So we know that the fall of the year is when Adam actually fell, right? It's amazing because, note, in the very beginning, the first Passover they ever had, the first Passover, now, if we think about the first fall that's recorded in the Bible, it would be the fall of Lucifer. From above, like Barak, he fell down, lightning, I saw in Luke chapter 10, after he sent out the 12 and the 70, and they came back and said, even the demons are subject unto us. 
And he says, he says, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Behold, I saw Lucifer fall from heaven. Behold, I saw Lucifer fall like Barak, which is the word lightning, from heaven. Right? So, the first one, but guess what? The sons of God wasn't redeemed. Why? Because they were already in heaven. They rejected God and was cast down. There was no sacrifice made for them. But now the fall on earth, God makes a sacrifice for Adam in the beginning. And that's where we see Exodus as the first recorded Passover. But the first recorded Passover is actually in Genesis chapter 2. Actually chapter 3. When God slays a lamb, clothes them, right? Blood is spilt, clothes them, passes over Adam's transgressions, and they are exoduses. They're exited out of the garden. There's the second exodus that we see, right? We see blood. Wow. Right? You see the blood. You see the exodus. It says, um, here we see the direct connection between the two Adams, showing us that, I'm going to read Romans 5, 9 through 21. Check this out. Because we get these connections in, you know, in the New Testament, the New Covenant, and they're bringing us back to the beginning, but, you know, for the most part, there isn't a whole lot of in-depth that people go in and actually look at. So you're going to see the connection. I'm going to read Romans chapter 5, 9 through 21. Watch this how he makes the connection. He says, um, make sure I'm reading in the right place. Romans 5. Um, 5 through 21. Yeah, here, go. here we go. All right. He says, in, um, And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in all our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which was given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure a good man some would even dare to die. I'm going to get my... my uh, Grandmother Bible. I got notes in here, that's why I wanted to uh, grab it. I'm trying to transition, but it, I, I just can't see it happening. It's hard. Anyway, um, I tell you what, I'm going to skip all the way down to 12. Um, I'm going to verse 12. Watch this. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, right, and I, by death and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Okay? Wow. Paul is making a connection from Adam's death all the way to Moses when he put the blood on the door. These are two Passovers, right? Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him to come. And he says, so all of my, I'm going to stop there. All he's doing is making a connection between the two Adams, making a connection between the Exodus and the garden, because he's likening these two Adams, the Exodus and the garden, and the Exodus with Moses. You're going to catch it in a minute. Check this out. All right. Um, it says, Here we see a direct connection between the two Adams, showing us that Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the day God slayed the Lamb in the garden, is a direct connection to the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ, our atonement for sin. But what follows His death is not the dead season, meaning the winter the fall of the winter, but the springtime of life and new beginnings. Amen. And which brings me to the seven feasts. Okay? So I'm giving you, I want to keep you in line, I'm giving you the comparisons between Moses uh, and Jesus. Okay? These prophecies and fulfillments. Which brings me to the seven feasts. Each feast that we're going to be going over on Wednesday night portrays some aspect of the ministry of Christ. It says, number four, the Exodus. Paul relates baptism 
to the Exodus event because baptism symbolizes the death to the old man and the identification of the new man. And we can see that in Romans 6, 1 Corinthians 10. Number five, another likeness. The manna and the water, meaning the rock at Horeb, the New Testament applies both to Christ and to what happened at the Exodus account. Now, what I'm talking about here, I know it's, it's going to make sense in a minute, is you're going to see this process from Egypt and what happened in Egypt in every account. When they come up out of the Red Sea, the first place they stop, where they go, what's happening, the water that came out the rock, all the way till they get to God, is an exact, it is a image, or it's the imagery of you being, you know, coming out of the world system, being born again, right? And your journey, which is a picture from when they came up out of the Red Sea, it's a journey that God is showing us that we're going to walk through from the Red Sea to our encounter with God. So, from everything that happens from the Red Sea to God, you're going to see an example in our life in which we're walking today. And these keep repeating in the Bible over and over and over again. Alright? It's going to get better. I just got to lay a little bit of groundwork. How else does Moses and what happened back then you know, relate to the prophecies of Jesus Christ. The tabernacle in its materials, its colors, its furniture, the arrangement. The tabernacle clearly speaks of the person of Jesus Christ and the way of redemption. Right? We can see it in the tabernacle. The high priest, number seven. In several ways, the high priest foreshadows the ministry of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, which is spoken about in Hebrews chapter four and chapter nine. So let's get into it. The book of Exodus is all about redemption. Israel was redeemed from the bondage in Egypt into a covenant relationship with God the Father by miracles, signs, and wonders follows both Moses and Jesus, so the message of the Exodus still rings loud for you and me today. Redemption has been made. So come out of her, my people. You know, that's what it's all about. We talk to people. Do you realize that every time a sinner or someone receives the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is an exit or an exodus that happens from out of this world. Meaning from out of the worldly system into the kingdom of God. Yeah. There's a spiritual exodus that is still occurring every single day in a person's life. How does that, how is that accomplished? Man, we can look at pictures over and over and over again in the word how it's accomplished because it's the same way. Christ gives us an example of how a man must be born again and what happens in that process. Then we get all of these natural pictures through the word which gives us a clear picture on, you know, how is a man born again? What do we do when we're born again? How do we walk, right? It says, um, Redemption has been made, so come out of her, my people. The yoke of bondage. Egypt, Babylon, the taskmaster, which was Pharaoh, which is a picture of Satan. It's all there. It's a picture for you and I to see how we are to come out of it spiritually. So we have an understanding that we're not like the children of Israel wanting to stay in bondage or go back to Egypt that we learn, we're going to learn through this, that it's an example that we're to look at each and every day to line ourselves up to, is this what we're doing? Is this how we're walking? Are we trusting in Him? Right? Therefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Wow. Wow. Check this out. 
I will redeem you. We know that Moses was a picture of Christ to come. We know that just as the children of Israel was in bondage and captivity for 430 years, then they were set free through the prophet Moses, God using Moses to set them free. They were, they were actually set free by the last plague, the blood. Right? The death of the firstborn. And God said, watch this. He said, you tell them that I'm going to redeem them and set them free through an outstretched arm. Hallelujah. Wow. Watch what he says. An outstretched arm. Wow. And judgments. Mm. But you see, when Christ came and redeemed us with the outstretched arm, you know, remember he read from Luke chapter 4 and verse 31? You remember he, what he said in Luke, which is Isaiah 61? Yeah. He reads from Isaiah. Check this out. He, this is pretty amazing because he redeemed Israel by an outstretched arm and judgments. But you see, He's redeemed us through an outstretched arm, but we haven't saw the judgments yet. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> you with me? Yeah. And He confirms this in, in Isaiah 61. I'm going to read it to you. Watch. I'm going to no, go to Luke 4. Because this is a direct connection to how we're going to be redeemed in our exodus in the end. You see, the redemption of the outstretched arm has already happened. But he's coming, he's coming with a sword, riding on a horse, with judgments. Right. You got me? Yeah. Where, where Egypt received the judgments and then the death of the firstborn first, we get the death of the firstborn first and then the judgments come. You got me? Yeah. Think about it. It's all a picture of His coming. We can look at what happened in Egypt and see exactly what's going to happen when the Lord comes because Pharaoh in Isaiah 27, it says that Pharaoh is symbolic to Lephiathan, Satan, which holds us in bondage. Think about what it is, why we have to be redeemed, why nobody is redeemed when they're born, how you're always in sin. We spoke about it Wednesday night when, you know, a certain person had said, well, you know, the, the children are innocent when they're born. No, they're not. And if you, I'm going to take it even a step further. Think about this, that Egypt is a womb. Egypt means black. The children of Israel were born in darkness. What was inside of that darkness? Sin, Pharaoh, Satan. Egypt is a womb. Now think about this. You're born, right? Regular birth, conception, you're in a womb, which is the word matrix. Wow. Oh, now you know what the movie The Matrix is about. What? You want to know what the real story of the Matrix is? Right? In Neo, right? Neo's called the One because his word is Neo, and when you rearrange the letters in an anagram, Neo's the One. Neo's the Deliverer. But Neo's not the One. He's the False One. They're in a Matrix. They're in a womb. Did you ever think about... You know, these things that are following the ship to attach themselves to the ship and lock on to it. They're trying to destroy the ships in the matrix. Right? They look like a tadpole. You know what tadpoles look like? Yes, you do know what tadpoles look like, right? Wow. These tadpoles is what exactly happens when a man and a woman comes together and there's something, a fight that's going on until one tadpole gets to where it needs to be. The matrix. There's a battle inside of the womb, and they're trying to plant the seed. Neo, we're looking at a movie, which you look at a movie, 
and you're like you're rooting for Neo and them in the ship and you want them to win and they're battling all of these you know this, this guy and all of this stuff it's important what I'm telling you because it's it's you know but really you're rooting for the wrong one you're deceived it's the contamination of the DNA that's trying to implant itself in the egg and eventually at the end of the movie Neo he's blinded and but he you know he he crash lands and makes contact you know which is wow it's all about gets into but it's the womb it's the matrix now watch how crazy is this Egypt is a womb so when you're born you're born in darkness sin is already in you Pharaoh's in you right the enemy is already within so when you try to leave his kingdom guess what he's coming behind you yeah, yeah. he's coming after you right? right absolutely like wow just think about it Egypt is a womb why did God bring them there to show them they were in sin that was in bondage they needed a deliverer right watch he says I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Look, I'm going to hit this scripture real quick. Luke chapter 4. Jesus says in Luke chapter 4, um, um, He says this. He's, this is when He begins His ministry. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. What? When he says this in there, what do you think they're thinking about? That's right. They're thinking about Egypt. I'm reading in verse 18. Chapter 4, verse 18. You see the connection? Watch. He says, he says uh, to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and sat down, it says. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because Christ is going to redeem us with an outstretched arm. Jesus closed the book right there. Why did He close the book? He's reading Isaiah 61. Let's see what's next. Why did He close the book? Because when He closed the book right there, He told you everything He was coming to do, but the next part of it, it wasn't time for that yet. Because all of that is a foreshadow of number one spiritually our exodus from the world and number two physically our exodus when the Lord comes and gets us Wow right and he says here the spirit he quotes from Isaiah 61 this is the advent of the Messiah the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to pro proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That was Egypt. It was a prison. They couldn't go nowhere. Right? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. What's the next verse? And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. What? Judgment. We could finally say... You know, Jesus said, look, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Right? Yeah. Don't worry about the judgment right now. It's coming. Yeah. Man, is that going to be a day? Man. You see the connection between the two. It's a direct connection. And if you're a Jew or Jewish and you've been studying this your whole life, you would know exactly what Jesus is saying, the implications that he's making. Because after he had said this, they wanted to kill him. That's right. Yeah. Amen. John even identifies him and says, that's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They killed the lamb, in, the lamb in Egypt. The children of Israel was in bondage for 430 years. And then Moses came, and through judgments and an outstretched arm, they were set free. They were birthed, a new birth through blood, the death of the firstborn, and through the waters. It's 
I mean, and in Christ, from Malachi, check this out, from Malachi to Matthew, to when John the Baptist, Yohanan ben Zechariah, stands up and begins to preach, it was 430 years. So the exact repeat of 430 years of bondage in Egypt and a lamb dying. God didn't speak to them when they were there. The Bible says in Malachi that the word was precious in those days for God did not speak unto the people. All the prophets were silenced for 430 years and then John starts preaching. Right. And they come and say, are you the Messiah? Man, the word of God hasn't been spoken for 430 years. Right. And John says, that's the Lamb. That's the Lamb of God. Hey, people, that's the Lamb. That's the one that you put on your door. That's what he's symbolic to, that takes away the sins of the world. The one that is going to set you free from Satan, from bondage. He told Ezekiel, Ezekiel, lay on your side 390 days on your right side. Turn over and lay on your side uh, 40 days on your other side. That's how long the children of Israel are going to be in bondage before they're set free. 390 and 40 is 430. It's over and over again. Wow. Watch this. Do you realize the Bible says that when the children of Israel, check men, this is so absolutely mind-blowing. God is so absolutely amazing. Watch this. We're going to read it. I'm going to show it to you. This is Egypt. You know that when Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Amen. Remember that? Well, literally, the children of Israel in, in, in Egypt wore yoke. Yeah. They wore yokes around their neck, and that's how they carried the blocks and the waters to build Pharaoh's houses, his treasure houses. When Jesus said, hey, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he said, come unto me and I will give you Sabbath. Mm. I'll give you rest for your weary soul. You see, he's saying, you see all of these connections that he's telling them. You think, oh, my yoke is easy and my bird's light. You don't even, you're not even thinking about that these people wore yokes on their neck. A yoke, like an ox. Right. So when he says, my yoke is easy, what do you think they're thinking about? That yoke in Egypt. I bet you didn't think about that, huh? Because you don't wear a yoke. A real one, anyway. But Jesus said, you do have a yoke on you. Come on. And you've been working for a taskmaster for a long time. Everything that you're carrying. He said, my yoke is easy. And you can drop it at the cross, son. Right. My um, God. Hallelujah. You see, we don't think about it too much spiritually, what we carry. <laughs> but the true thing is, you're wearing a yoke unless you've received Jesus. In the difference between the natural and the spiritual, Jesus said, I give you the natural to understand the things of the Spirit. Amen. He's trying to tell you, spiritually, you're carrying way too much. Amen. You have to give it to me. And I will give you rest for your soul. Amen. Could you imagine just being able to trust in Him with everything? How much rest would you have? Man, we worry about our bills. Yeah. We worry about everything. Why? Come on. Because our taskmasters. We're building the treasure cities every day. We have to. Or we'll die. 
and we don't even know it. We've been deceived in this machine that we're all part of working every day. Right? But you know what? We know that one day we're going to be set free. Amen. Amen. But you know what? We can already be set free spiritually. Amen. Though we have to go in the world every day to keep everything running like it's supposed to, we have a hope that a great exodus yes. is coming. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. We have already been redeemed mm -hmm. yeah. by the outstretched arm. Amen. And if you've been redeemed by the outstretched arm, judgments will not befall you. Because those that were redeemed by the outstretched arm passed through the sea untouched Amen. and unharmed. Oh, yeah. But those who wasn't redeemed by the blood, when they tried to pass through the sea, Amen. wow, good stuff, huh? Yeah. Here, me a little bit more crazy for you, man. The account of the Exodus, which we're going to read, when God was setting them free, just to let you know that the plagues that hit Egypt or the identical plagues that happen in Revelations because Revelations is all about the coming of the Lord in our exodus and his judgment on the world in fact Jesus fulfilled two of the plagues that was in Egypt remember here I'll if I started at 10 I started at 10, right, over here, this number 10 that redeemed him. He was the lamb, right? Number 9 was in Egypt there was darkness for three days. And when Jesus died on the cross, it was darkness for three hours. Wow. Wow. Right? The last one is the blood in the water. Every plague that happened in Egypt, you know, the frogs, the water, the lice, the hail fire and brimstone, everything that happened, the famine, is the exact plagues of Revelations that's going to happen. The exact ones. Identical but described in a different way. But you see, when the first horse rides out, such and such happens. Second horse, this happens. You see these plagues are exactly the same. Right? Here. Let's keep going. Watch this. So, this is Egypt. This is the womb. This is the matrix. It says, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, He did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, toward the Mediterranean Sea because it says if they see war they'll turn around and run back. Why? Because they're babies. They're children. They're not warriors. Right? It's a new birth. Well, if they went through the way of the Philistines they wouldn't have walked through the new birth process. You have to have the water. So look, Egypt, it says God took them by the way into the wilderness and took them through the canyons. Luscious. He took them through the way of... Uh, let me give you the word of... Um, Because it's important. I give you this word. It says, and they, uh, he brought them through the wilderness and they walked through the wadi. The wadi. W-A-D-I. Watch this. 
the wadi was 18 miles long all the way unto the, to, unto the mouth of the wadi, which is uh, Nueva Beach. Now, Nueva Beach, it opens up, you know, the Gulf of Agaba. They came through a canyon of 18 miles, which was actually a riverbed they walked. On either side of them, there was a canyon wall. And Pharaoh said, for there truly have been bounded up in the wilderness. Now Pharaoh raises up his army to come after them. Right? They left around midnight. They go through the wilderness. They're in an 18-mile canyon. Pharaoh finds out what's going on. He says, there's no way out. They're trapped. We're going to kill them. All the way to the mouth of the Red Sea, where God parts the Red Sea and they come out on the other side and sing and dance. What is going on? The Bible says that the children of Israel were birthed, yeah. birthed in Egypt. It was the womb. The canyon walls, the wadi, was the birthing canal. Right. Blood, they go through, the baby leaves the womb, right? They walk a riverbed, the water comes through the birthing canal. God opens parts to waters at Nueva Beach, where it's called the mouth or the opening. Wow! Wow! And you have a birth that comes forth. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> of crickets. <laughs> Boy, you think he ate something? Wow. I'm like, you talk about give you a new wow. <laughs> of the new birth process. Come on, brother. If you can't connect that, something is wrong, son. <laughs> something is wrong. This is why the new birth is so important. Because un unless you are redeemed by the outstretched arm and have come through the birthing canal, the direction in which Jesus Christ has called us to move through, which is through the birthing canal, directs us to be in repent, die to self, and be baptized, right? When you die to that old man that's in the sea, the Red Sea, that's it. When you come up on the other side, you're no longer the same person. Right. Amen. And guess what? Sin is gone. Right. It has no more hold of you, on you. That's it. It's over. It's done. Amen. And that's where the enemy is crushed. Yeah. Because you have to take part in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If you don't, if you don't, well then you didn't follow the birthing canal. You might have been redeemed through the outstretched arm. And then, well, I'm going to go around this other way. Wow. Wow. Boy, you talk about give you a whole new insight on when Paul starts talking about a new creation in 1 Corinthians and Romans and Thessalonians and 2 Corinthians 5 and John chapter 3. And you find out that it was the wind that Jesus spoke of in John 3 that makes a way where there seems to be no way. When he tells Nicodemus, Oh, not thou a great teacher? You don't know what I'm talking about? Golly. Keep reading. Man, you guys are in for a ride, son. I ain't even started yet. Amen. I know I can't give it to y'all on one day. I, I must have wrote four more pages last Come night. On, Let's see this. Watch this. <sighs> He says, All right, Therefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Now therefore, says the Lord, if you will obey my voice, check this out, if you will obey my voice, what does that mean? 
That means we need to obey what the Lord says. Right? right? Indeed. And keep the covenant. You see, God was drawing them out to make a covenant with them. The same thing that God did for you and me through Jesus Christ drew us out of the world to make a covenant with us. You have to keep the commandments. And Jesus said the commandments are not burdensome. You can fulfill them just in love. No judgment. Because judgment, it's not time yet. Right? Watch what he says. Then you shall be to me a peculiar treasure. Unto me above all people. Check the words out. A kingdom of priests. A holy nation. Does that, is, is that what's spoken about in the New Covenant? Yes, it is. Yes. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. It's, just, it's the same covenant. Except one was by a lamb. And the other one was by the son. Right? The climax of the Exodus is recorded in chapters 12 through 14. The salvation of Israel through blood. The atoning Passover. And through the power of the Red Sea. Wasn't that the first sign? Check him out. What did he tell? What was the first sign that he showed Pharaoh? Hey, kick that AC off on me, please. What, what was the first sign he showed Pharaoh? Right, remember? The first sign was the staff turning into the serpent. But the first plague he put on them was blood to water. That's right. That's the new covenant. Remember? Jesus, the blood is symbolic to the wine. Jesus changed the water into wine. Remember? John chapter 3. It's the blood of the new covenant. He was telling them and showing them on the first plague that he put out, when he changed all the water to blood, he was letting them know it's going to be, by, it's going to be a new covenant that he's making. How they're going to be set free. And that's why through Christ, when he died, blood and water flowed out of his side. The birthing canal. The same place God took the first bride, Eve, out of the side of Adam is where God had Jesus laid down and he took his bride out of his side. Watch this. Now, the first sign was... Blood and water. Now, it says, we see the outstretched arm and the power of, I'll redeem you by an outstretched arm and by the power of the Red Sea. Why was it called the Red Sea? Well, it's actually called the Gulf of Agaba. Why did the children of Israel call it the Red Sea? Because of the blood. It says they saw the dead Egyptians on the shores. Well, you just think it was just drowned people? If a thousand foot wave comes crashing down and you in a chariot, that ain't much, it's, it's going to be, you know. Let me even take it a little bit further for you. Well, man, I got to hold that. I'm going to hold that one. Golly. The Red Sea, the red water, the blood in the water, the new covenant. The Red Sea is where Pharaoh and his men died. I read that to you guys, right? It doesn't say it right there when you read it in Exodus. But David, when he wrote it in Psalms 136, it says that, you know, that Pharaoh in his army died in the sea. This is a story. This is the story of a man that would have to die. This is, this is what it's about. The story of the Exodus is a story of a man that would have to die. A firstborn son, as was spoken in Egypt. So we, the children of Yahweh, of Yeshua, of Jesus, could be set free. Right? Y'all with me? The whole book of Exodus is about the redemption and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow. The two great exoduses. So put your sandals on your feet and gird up your loins. Pick up your staff. 
Because deliverance is at the door. Amen. Now, you know, you know why he told them to pick up their staff? Put your sandals on your feet, gird your loins, and put your staffs in your hand. Now, I wrote right here, so put your sandals on your feet, right? Feet represent the gospel. Gird up your loins with the belt of truth, the Bible says, right? And I put, and, uh, and pick up your sword, because deliverance is at the door. The sword is the word of God. Amen. This is where we get our record event of what God has done. Well, the staff, their staff in their hand is how their generations recorded their fathers passed down their staffs and their generations of what happened and everything was written on their staff. Yeah. Pick up your staff. Pick up your record. Pick up your sword That's right. of what I've done before. That's what it was about. Note, when Israel, the children of God, left Egypt, it was in a ruinous heap. Yeah. So it's about the Lord's return, right? So when the children of Israel left Egypt, it was in a ruinous heap, destroyed by God's outstretched arm, by judgments and plagues. But it wasn't until the last plague that his children were delivered. Hmm. You understand? If that's a picture of the end, and they were protected in Goshen, they wasn't they didn't come out to the last plague. Wow. I don't know. Next week, we're going to take a real close look at the meaning of the Exodus. And I'm going to give you this last thing, and we're going to, we're going to end. The Exodus that was, the Exodus that is, and the Exodus that is to come. The Exodus revealed. Revelations. You ready? Yeah. I'm going to give you some Exodus accounts in the Bible. First one was Lucifer was exiled out of heaven, right? The second one, Adam exiting the garden. He went eastward. Remember that? There was a blood sacrifice that had to be made. Cain, driven out from the face of God. Blood, spilled his brother's blood. Wow. Right? The earth was baptized in all flesh except Noah uh, died. You heard me? Come on. So the earth, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? I'm talking about when the earth was God said, and the great deeps of the, o of the earth opened up, and it rained from the heaven for the first time for 40 days and 40 nights. It said geysers were like blowing up out of the earth, right? And all that had breath in its nostrils, except Noah, Shem, Hem, and Jabeth, and their wives were all saved. Well, guess what? That was an exodus. All that were alive died in the earth. They exited. Gone. Noah, Noah and the um, Noah and the Exodus of the Ark. Noah exited the Ark. Is that an Exodus? Well, it's kind of funny. He exited the Ark and there's blood. He makes a sacrifice. Right? Yeah. Mm. Well, we could tie some things in. Abraham leaving his homeland by faith. That was an exodus. Yeah. Same exodus, by faith, you and I. Guess what? Jesus Christ didn't come to bring peace, Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, but a sword Amen. to divide mother from, and brother and sister and father. Because that's what the Word of God is going to do. It's going to divide. Abraham leaving his homeland by faith. His father was an idol maker of Nimrod. That's right. Yeah. That's what his father was. And God said, leave him. 
exited this place. Get away from it. Come out of her, my people. Let me ask you a question. I'm on number five. Let me ask you a question really quick. All the children of Israel that was in Egypt, do you know they wasn't in bondage for 430 years? They was in bondage for about, I mean, really for about 250 years or so. Right. Because it says when Joseph came and all his brothers and, the, you know, the 70 that was there, Joseph was head in command. And it says they all, you know, they got the best land of Egypt. Yes. Oh, my God. These dudes got fat, son. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph, they moved up into upper echelon positions. They look like, they look like Egyptians. How do you know that? When Moses left Egypt and came there to the, you know, to Midian, to where Jethro was, and he delivered, you know, uh, his wife, Yoshebel, you know, that he had married, you know, she come back and told her daddy, an Egyptian delivered us. Yeah. They become part of the society. They become great and mighty, the Pharaoh said. Look at the children of Israel. They have become great and mighty in our sight. Let me ask you another thing. Do you think they intermarried? Yeah. Yes, they did. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Wow. How do you know that? I mean, yeah. Joseph married the priest of On's daughter. Yeah. That's right. Had two sons. Mm -hmm. Manasseh and Ephraim. They were half Jews. When God was putting the plagues on Egypt, and these people, after about 250 years, this Pharaoh that rose up that didn't know Joseph, which was about 200 years later, says, look at them, they've grown mighty. At least another army come and try to take us over. They'll join them and, 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 and wipe us out. Let's put them into bondage and slavery. The world's fun and it's good for a moment, for a time. But there's a time the enemy is going to come and put you in bondage by what you've been having fun with. Right. And you have to make a decision whether you're going to come out of her or you're going to stay in her. Do you think all the Jews put the blood on their doorposts and lentils? Do you think they all did it? No. No. Do you think all the Jews came out? Yeah. No. No, they did not. Wow. Kind of look at it today. Think about the Jews that married, you know, whether it was a good-looking man or a good-looking woman. And God says... He's calling them out from amongst the people. And the husband says, I ain't going. I'm an Egyptian. I'm staying. You believe all of that? Pharaoh's going to, where are you going to go? In a wilderness? In a desert? You're going to trust who? You think all of this that's happening? Listen. You think all the signs that have been given today that Jesus spoke about? Don't you think they would have been saying, oh, you think this is God? It's weather patterns. It's weather change. Yeah. I'm not leaving. I'm not putting blood on my door. <laughs> and when God called him out, he called him out. He said, be ready with your staff in your hand, sandals on your feet, with your loins girded. Be ready. And at midnight, the call went out. Go. Amen. Wow. How do I know they didn't leave? Because Egypt and Babylon was the same way. You know how many people was carried off into Babylon? Hundreds, Hundreds of thousands. Only a remnant left Babylon. Right. They said about maybe 14,000 left Babylon to come back home to Jerusalem to be, look, called out of Babylon after what? 70? How many went in Egypt? 70? Yeah. What? You see the connections? The majority chose to stay in the world system. You know what happened once they left and went back to Jerusalem? 
King Nebuchadnezzar was sacked and the city was destroyed. Right. How many Jews you think died because they didn't come out? They didn't listen to God. Oh, we'll come out and follow you maybe when you get to the promised land. You know, send us an email or a card or something and we'll come over there where you're at. I'm sorry, but it just ain't going to happen. It's the same way in the world today. God is calling people out. Calling them out. Separate yourself. Come out from amongst them. But they want to stay. Amen. They want to go back. Oh, they go out a little ways. No, what, Pharaoh's coming? I'm sneaking off the path. No, God brought him in a canyon 18 miles. If you made the decision to leave Israel, I mean to leave Egypt, once you make that decision, he put him in a birthing canal in a canyon and he said, there ain't no going back. Right. Because if you go back, Pharaoh's there. And you think he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna be merciful unto you? No, he's going to kill you. What is that a picture of? Come to Christ and leave him. Come to Christ and leave. Go back into the world doing the things you did. You wind up dead. Right. That's what the Bible says. Because of the heart of the, Israel, uh, the Israelites when they went in the wilderness, they kept wanting to do what their fathers did. It says they were laid waste in the wilderness of sin. Right. Oh, we can get saved and do what we want. Are you crazy? Yeah, come on now. Have you lost it? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a treasure, if you keep covenant with me. Amen. If you don't. You're on your own. Wow. Abraham leaving his home by faith. Abraham sending off all his sons. He exited all his sons because of Isaac. He sent off all the other sons away from Isaac. Made them leave. Because Isaac was the one. There's another picture. Isaac put the wood on his back, carried it to the mountain. The sacrifice. The ram caught in a thicket, a thorn bush. The thorns represented the curse of the earth. The ram was caught by its horns in the thorns. The thorns that was placed on Jesus' head. He bore the curse. Rebecca leaving her family for Isaac. Can you imagine that? She didn't know. Didn't even know what he looked like. How many of you guys would leave for a man you don't even know what he looks like? Huh? Well, let me see this cat. Send me a picture. <laughs> let me see what he looks like before I go over there. What you really should be asking is, man, what's his heart like? What is he like? Is he going to love me? Is he going to take care of me? Come on now. Is he going to think about me? Hey, man, I'm a bride. I'm the bride of Christ. I don't want to go. I don't know what he looks like. I left for him. But I know his love for me. Come on. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. You can even, even an ugly person will grow on you. <laughs> Once you're around him for a while, man, he ain't so bad looking. And you ain't even got to take a drink. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Jacob swipe from Esau. You know what? I'm going to stop. I got a bunch of them right here, and we're going to get into it next week. You know, we're going to go through this right here. And what's going to be, listen, what's going to be far better than this is when I start reading Exodus to you. Yeah. Oh my God, son. You talk about going to blow you out of the waters. Yeah. You're going to see Exodus. You're going to see the revelation in Exodus. 
you're going to see your life in Exodus. You're going to see what you've been called to in Exodus. Hallelujah. You're going to see faults that they made that we need to not make. Amen. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I told you I wasn't going to get too crazy today. Let's pray. Alright, I left off at uh, I guess number 8. Five. Let's pray. 5, good. That's so much more. Joe always told me, he said, you know, I'm not finished, but I quit. I'm not finished, but I quit. <laughs> I've not yet begun. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Um, we're in for a rod. Come on, Don't forget Wednesday nights. Um, yes. Wednesday nights is actually going to tie, you see, is going to tie a lot of this in as well because we're getting into the feast and which was, you know, God calling them out and why they did it and, you know, how it applies. But anyway, uh, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for, Lord, just your word. You are so absolutely amazing, Lord. After 15 years, Father, and I know that's not even no time, Lord, of really studying and, and getting into your word, Lord, you still just blow me away. Lord, I just, uh, I just pray for the people. Pray for us, Lord. For You say in your word, Lord, that you make intercession for us. And I'm no different than anybody in here. Just a man. Lord, help us, Father. You know all the things, you know the battles that we go through, Lord. The flesh, strong, the spirit, just being weak. Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, that just you would strengthen us, each and every one of us in here, Father, in our inner man, Lord, to walk in covenant with you, Father. Lord, so we can be right, Father, vertically between us and you, Father, so we can be right horizontally, one with another, and with our spouses, and with our friends, with our loved ones, Lord. Lord, we're not here to pass judgment on anybody, Father. But we just, we thank you, Father, for what you've done for us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, that you would keep them when they leave here today, Father. Lord, that you would uh, just, just rain, Father, life into their, their lives, their hearts, their marriages, Father, and their relationships, and Father, their jobs, Lord. Father, one of the amazing things of the great exodus, Father, was Lord that it says that when they exited, exited Egypt there was not one that was sick Father and we know that was because of the Passover the Lamb there was no sicknesses Father after being in bondage for 430 years because the blood of Yeshua in his outstretched arm cleansed us in our inner man there's no sickness no more spiritually Father, that you took away all our diseases, Father. Lord, I thank you for it, Father. Lord, be with them today, Father. Thank you for your goodness and your word. Keep them safe and bring them back next week, Lord, so we can just continue to seek you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.